So good morning, everybody. I hope you had a very good nonviolent break. <laughs> no untoward episodes in it. <laughs> I know some of you went to exotic places, and I'd like to hear about that from you when we get a chance. Uh, I, I hope you all got my uh, course web announcement that I will have a truncated office hour today because at 12.30 I'm going to be uh, having a radio interview with Kathy Kelly, who is somebody that I hope you will learn to know and love as I do. She and I are being interviewed on a program called Values of the Wise, in case you wanted to get it on the, on the web. I don't know how they got me on that program, but that was their choice. Um, and I'll try to make up for that with some other hours as soon as we get a chance and settle down from the holiday. Your papers, uh, your proposals for the term paper are here. I hope you enjoy the alphabetization. It's a superb alphabetization job by Amy. Uh, I'm just going to hand them around now because I don't think we have time for me to hand them back individually, much as I'd still like to get to know some of you better. Some of your proposals, I think I would say the proposals varied from good to awesome. Some of them were really fantastic. It could actually lead to uh, successful nonviolent revolutions in various parts of the world. <laughs> Elizabeth, we have seats up here if you, if you care. <laughs> um, now, some of you have not gotten your midterm papers back yet, and that's not a good move because you want to look at those and see what you didn't know and, and use them as a learning tool. Okay. Um, just in terms of the world, instead of PAX 164B for a second, not that those two are so different, um, but tomorrow ends what's called the season of nonviolence, which is a 64 day period that stretches from the uh, memorial of the assassination of Gandhi on January 30th to the assassination of Martin Luther King, which is tomorrow, April 4th. Uh, I was talking about this tomorrow, uh, uh, talking about this yesterday. I transcended time, as you can tell. I was talking about this yesterday at San Francisco State, and uh, they invited me to speak to sort of wrap up the season. And I said, I hope you won't feel that this is ungrateful for me to do this. But I think this is the wrong season, and it's typical of a bad move that is constantly made in the peace movement, and that is to memorialize death and violence and negativity instead of memorializing life and nonviolence and the real. And they took it pretty well. But it's, a, it's an example of how when you're struggling to create a new way of looking at things, a new paradigm. I'm going to get back to that term in a second. We are struggling to create a new paradigm, which we've been doing, you know, consciously since 1970. We being a very small group of people. Um, what you sometimes find is that you, when you reach out to do the opposite of the system that you disagree with, you often end up unconsciously taking over some of their symbols and with it some of their meanings and some of their values. And this I think is a good example of that. that we, should, we should completely turn our back on the idea of celebrating death and just, just do our own thing. Not in a sentimental way. I mean, you're not flower children or anything. But I mean, my main point is not to take over the symbols of the, uh, of the other side. Oscar, I hope we can talk for just a second after class. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say something about uh, paradigm shift. Uh, this is really an unfortunate thing that makes me very unhappy. The State Department, I, think, I guess it must probably be the Justice Department has recently said that we have to get ready for a paradigm shift in America in terms of security where we now are going to have to accept the fact that it's legal to spy on American citizens. So, and they're calling that a paradigm shift. So you see, here's our great word, which we were going to use to break out of all of this. And what did they do? They came along and they co-opted it as though more fascism was a paradigm shift when you've already got too much fascism. 
So it's, it's pretty galling and pretty upsetting. And in fact, this is not the first time this has happened. I happen to have studied a little bit uh, early fascist movement in Europe. Well, that's, a that's too grand a way to put it. I stayed in an apartment in Paris where the guy was a professor who was an expert in this and I read his books. Uh, I didn't study it, you know. I read his books and I picked up some very interesting things about fascism and in some ways it was a whacked out movement. Pe you have whole, <laughs> whole police departments exercising, doing their calisthenics in the nude, things like that that you don't usually associate with fascism. You associate it with certain beaches in, San Fran in California. <laughs> but the other thing that I uh, learned <laughs> from that brief uh, exposure was that they called their movement De Noia Vela, the new wave. So they captured people's desire to break out and experience something new and turned that into deepening the old. So I don't know what lesson I'm drawing from all of this, but it made me so mad I thought I'd have to share it with you guys. It's known as venting. And there's nothing you can do about it. So let's get back to our topics. Now we're a little bit off from the uh, syllabus as you've noticed. I had to rearrange some things because of guest speakers and we knew that would happen. So Thursday we're having John Lindsay Poland from Fellowship of Reconciliation. When I first met him he was working with Peace Brigades International. So he's got a long track record working in South America uh, for nonviolent causes. And so I have already talked a little bit about the stuff that's on the syllabus for today, namely CHIPCO and the other uh, anti-globalist movements, rough to call them that, that are taking place in India. So this was to carve out the opportunity now to talk about globalism itself and how does it figure in for us who are coming at the world from a nonviolent perspective. The other thing that you had on your readings, which I really haven't had a chance to discuss yet, are the people in Peace is the Way. You know, I know that you've all been keeping up diligently with the reading. So you read all of these essays. Wipe that smile off your face, Nagler. <laughs> you read all of these essays. What I did was I chose people who were representative of different viewpoints and who I also thought were important opinion leaders in the creation of the nonviolent, what we used to call paradigm. I don't know what we're going to call it now that they've stolen our word. Um, but those the people that I assigned from Peace is the Way, an FOR production, w along with Kathy Kelly, I think are some of the people who are really trying to figure this thing out for us in both in action and in theory. Um, by the way, Alex, I know I owe you an email. I've forgotten to get back to you on something. Okay. So – Good. Uh, from the nonviolent point of view, I'm going to make a big generalization here. I'm going to do some, some big picture stuff and look way back in history. You could describe global history as not what biologists call a punctuated equilibrium, but rather a punctuated evolution. In other words, in one sense, it's been an absolutely steady process where you started with people in very, very small communities isolated from one another and they proceed to grow and expand. And then of course you have new modes of transportation and now you have new modes of virtual transportation known as information technology and people encounter each other much more closely than they did before. And what's going to happen at these stages where people suddenly become aware of one another? Well. In a famous essay on, on what's called the perpetual peace tradition, we're going to have to do a chalk satyagraha at some point. This, this is what we're reduced to. Oh, thank you. That's right. I keep forgetting. Okay. Aha. <laughs> I was enjoying complaining about it. No. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, perpetual peace is a term that we give to a, a tradition of thought which really lasted for hundreds of years and was an attempt to think of a way that the human species could live at peace. 
it wasn't a terribly effective tradition because in a, in a couple of ways it wasn't very realistic. It relied mainly on law and treaties. And you know, during the Cold War it was calculated that the average lifespan of a treaty was uh, two and a half years if, if you were lucky. It's just – it's just words on paper. You cannot legislate world peace. But I think the best – intellectually the best contribution ever made to this whole tradition was an essay by Immanuel Kant, which he wrote in 1895 – sorry, 1795, but who's counting? called uh, Zum Ewigen Frieden on, – on Perpetual Peace. And it – well, I, I was going to say it really repays reading, but you'd have to have about three spring breaks to read it. I mean, Kant was – oh, very dense. German, English, nothing is going to help. It's very, very dense reading. But it, unfortunately, it's – every now and then you come across something brilliant and you realize that you had to schlog through all of this stuff to get to that nugget. So. Someday when you find yourself on the Galapagos Islands for three weeks with nothing else to do, bring a German dictionary and some Ewigen Frieden with you and ex enjoy this thing. One of the points that he <coughs> makes in that treatise is that nature has figured out a way of keeping us from waging war on one another. Very simple. She scattered us all over the globe. We can't wage war on one another because we can't reach each other. Well, of course we now know that that was naive. Now you can press a button in Moscow and a silo will open up in some submarine in the mid-Atlantic or something and there'll be no more I heart New York <laughs> going on anymore. So that was in a way naive, but it brings out an interesting point that it seems like the world process has provided Isolation as a temporary measure, which if we use it properly, we could develop mechanisms robust enough that we could withstand exposure to other communities. Let me make this a little clearer what I'm talking about because I can see that Sam is puzzled through this. Take a look at a community – one of the um, peaceable people studied uh, in that anthropological sweep and brought in about 55 communities. They're called the Semoi. I think I've mentioned them before. There's different ways of spelling that and writing it. And they live in the middle of the Malay Peninsula. And they are isolated. They were obviously driven up country when the Malays arrived. And so they live in rainforest at top high altitudes and they don't mingle much with the Malay. And they developed uh, – a non – I'm going to call it a non-dash violent culture. In other words, it was a culture that enabled them to avoid violence, but it didn't give them a robust mechanism for dealing with violence when it occurred. These are the people who had this folk tale about, you know, someone will, t will sit around the fire at night and he'll say, I was walking through the, the jungle with my friend. And suddenly, uh-oh, what did we come across? A bunch of Malays. You know those down country people, they're very uncivilized and violent and so they started attacking us immediately. And I stood there and said, said to my friend, you run. And I said, take me, spare my friend. And the Malays were so impressed that they left me alone. This is a great nonviolent episode. The first anthropologist who collected this story was very excited. The second anthropologist who collected it 20 years later was beginning to get concerned. And by the fifth anthropologist, <laughs> we realized that this is not a story that actually happened. It's part of their folklore. But that's okay for our purposes. Who, you know, we don't care what happened up there in the jungle. Uh, what we care about is that these people had a nonviolent culture in which they praised courage as a way of overcoming conflict. But then uh, a form of early globalization known as the Cold War happened and all of Southeast Asia was swept up into this uh, brawl between the U.S. and the USSR disguised as an ideological conflict. Uh, you remember Galbraith saying that in capitalism man exploits man and in communism it's exactly the other way around. 
So they're just jousting really for who's going to get to exploit the rest of the world. Anyway, the point here is that the semi got swept up into this conflict. And so you might think, oh, they were dragged into it kicking and screaming. They dragged their feet. They didn't know how to handle weapons. They were very reluctant. But alas, what actually happened was they went ballistic. Uh, they just went completely over the top. Cannibalism, everything. It was grotesque. And I guess the way to understand this is they had mechanisms for damping violence but not for really coping with it despite that story that I told you. And their uh, unanimity and their harmony was predicated on common hatred of another. You all recognize this from Pax 164a. This is the old scapegoating business. And it works very well as long as Kant's principle obtains. And you don't encounter anybody else outside the community. It will, quote, work, unquote. But it will not, no quotes, work. It will not really make things better in a long-term and stable way. So we, this is what I'm calling this punctuated evolution where you have peace mechanisms which last up to a certain level of integration and then they don't withstand the shock of you know, first contact, contact with uh, the developed world. And this is not only a phenomenon that happens to these indigenous communities, but the very perpetual peace tradition was uh, at fault here because it was mostly what they turned out to mostly have in mind. This is the other great drawback of this tradition was let's have Christians stop fighting Christians. In other words, let's all gang up on the Turks and we'll have peace. Well, we're still suffering from the fallout from all this stuff. Can they join the European Union? I'm not sure. Who are they? Uh, should they? <laughs> Arby might have something to say on that. Anyway, uh, even in highly developed countries, there was uh, another stage of the same process of punctuation where you had an attempt to create a kind of peace regime, but it was predicated on the common ex expulsion of another. So it was not a stable regime that was going to really last. And so where are we now with all of this? Well, it looks like we are up to, the, as far as the planet Earth is concerned, and that is the main planet that I'm going to be concerned with here today, it looks like we are up to the final crisis slash opportunity. We have no way of isolating ourselves from one another anymore. You go into a cornfield and pick an ear of corn and it turns out it's got a funny gene that was put in it in Mexico and the wind brought it up to Nevada and then somebody accidentally took it on their shoes into California. And we, as I say, you know, we have weapons that go everywhere. We have spy satellites that photograph every square yard of the earth once a day or something like that. I, I don't remember. But uh, fortunately, we're safe in this ghastly classroom with no exposure to the outside world. It's probably not even true. But given all of these, this technology and the communication technology in particular and the weapons technology in another sense, all barriers are rapidly breaking down. So. If you want to look at this pessimistically, it looks like uh, you know, we don't have robust enough systems of conflict conversion that are going to help us get over this hump. But if you want to look at it optimistically, we're being forced to become one planet, whether we like it or not. It's either you know, become one planet or go into the dustbin <coughs> of cosmic history and you know, what we've been discovering in the last – what, what is it, about 10 or 15 years that there's lots of other planets out there? You know, if ours fails, uh, you know, God, whoever she is, probably has something else in mind for another one. However, we're responsible for this one, okay? I'm not saying we should not take this very, very seriously. But I am saying that behind all of the manifold critical aspects of the global uh, revolution that's happening, there is an opportunity behind every one of them. And so from the nonviolence point of view, conflict becomes the main problem. All the other problems are there, but they are 
secondary to the conflict problem integrated with it. And we want to try and look at this as an opportunity rather than a crisis for the most part. So I want to look at that crisis a little bit and think for just a bit about what globalism is. It's not something that I know a whole lot about, but you know, I've, I've done some thinking about it, read some books about it. We can all discuss it together. And I guess I would describe it as a, cri as a, a process which is both broader and deeper than we've ever seen before. Broader in the sense that we've just been talking about where I, I stayed with my niece uh, last night and she has a job where she travels a lot. and She was telling me, gee, I feel nervous. I'm walking around without a plane ticket in my wallet. I, I've never liked this. What, what's wrong? You know, I better get on the internet and get myself some tickets even though I'm not planning to go anywhere. Uh, that was tongue in cheek. But it does go to show you, you know, what, what the world is like. When, when we were in high school, we had one fellow student who actually went to Europe before he graduated high school. Now about half of us go to high school in Europe. Anyway, um, unless we come from Europe, in which case we go to high school here. But anyway, of course, it's broader in that sense and that's pretty obvious and everybody knows this. And uh, I have at least one friend, for example, in Holland. He's a brilliant entrepreneur, uh, Eckhart Winson, who w ran the first um, – software company in Holland and was forced out of it with only a couple of hundred million dollars to his name. He had a very funky office off in the woods somewhere in the center of Holland. And his great scheme is to have Holland continue to be the trade hub for the world that it has always been, but to have most of the trade be virtual. So you don't have to actually ship things there, shipping which is very costly and uses up a lot of fuel. You can just do it mostly by internet trading. Okay, so but that, that part of it is fairly obvious, but it's also a deeper globalization in the sense that people are reaching more deeply into the resources of nature to manipulate them. And uh, in a little while, I'm going to read you some highlights from an article on genetic, genetic modification. Um, okay. Now, as this system advances, what we've seen so far are little pockets of successful resistance, mostly when communities are pushed from poverty into destitution or there's a threat of that. So one of the iconic poster uprisings is Cochabamba. Is that what were you going to talk about, Kenny? The Zapatista uprising. Yes, of course. That's very, very – yeah. It's, well, they haven't decided yet what they are. I think we're going to – after I've read a few of your papers, we, we'll, we'll weigh in on whether they're violent or nonviolent. But I do know that Subcomandante Marcos sent a message up to a bunch of us a number of years ago when he had not laid down the gun yet. And he said, you show me a better way, I will take it. So he's not ideologically committed to violence. And then what they actually did was they used <coughs> violence – I'm not saying this is an okay thing to do, but they used it as a publicity stunt. Mm -hmm. They used it to show. Mm -hmm. Huh? Didn't they, use witnesses? they did use unarmed witnesses, and uh, it, it's it has led to a whole kind of a funny take on violence. I know there was a, uh, an email that went around a couple of years ago that said, "Air attack, EZLN air attack on armed camp." And you went and read a few lines down and it turns out what they did was they stood around this military base and they folded up – they had propaganda leaflets. They folded them into paper airplanes and sent them <laughs> over the fence into the camp. So – but the one I was going to actually talk about – I'm not going to talk about it much, just mention it – was Cochabamba where Bechtel decided to privatize the water resource. The Homo sapiens – sapiens have been probably you've been using – in Bolivia for 20,000 years, no problem. You know, it every, rains every year. They drink, it rains, they drink, it rains. It's going on just fine. But Bechtel said this is not a good situation. Nobody's making a profit. So they stepped in and privatized the water. And uh, two weeks later, Bechtel was out of that country. They had no mandate to operate in that country anymore because of a popular uprising, which was not uh, violent in the sense that nobody used arms 
or anything like that. Then I think the uprising became a downsetting, a down seething or whatever you want to say. It went right back down as soon as the issue was no longer there. But it leaves a bit of a residue and as you know you have a chain of very, very populist and for the most part anti-globalist heads of countries around Central, Central and South America now. Um, so to get a handle on this crisis, I'm going to recommend a couple of books, one very big and one very small. So you can take your pick which one you want to read. The big one is called The Case Against the Global Economy and For a Turn Toward the Local. It's by Jerry Mander and Edward Goldsmith. Jerry Mander is – I owe him a lot because he actually gave me the title of my first nonviolence book. That was – and it only cost me one latte in the Point Ray Station Cafe. So I'm really, really a good buddy with Jerry. So he's the person who wrote four arguments in favor of the elimination of television. He's one of these people who turned his advertising skills uh, into to good uses. He's <coughs> mainly interested in Native American cultures. And stuff. But there's another very small book which is called The Very Small Book on Globalism. There actually is a series of books that I believe Cambridge University Press puts out. It's called The Very Small Book on. It's not the same as X, Y, and Z for dummies. This, this is for smart people who don't have a lot of time. <laughs> and the, as most smart people don't because if you're smart, you know that things are in a very bad way and you better do something about it. But the one on globalism was by Manf Manfred Steger. And it's, it's a good way to get a quick overview of what this thing is. Um, I'm going to get back to him in a second, but I want to talk about uh, two other people and this really almost introduces a new topic which we're going to talk about as our last topic for the semester, namely a nonviolent culture. And I can't use the word paradigm for shi shift for this anymore because the term has been shifted to the other side. So let's use a term that's getting to be current and that's the great turning. This is the idea of – and there's a book on that subject by David Corton. And he represents a very good blend of theory and praxis. He runs something called the Center for Positive Futures up on Bainbridge Island in Washington and they publish Yes! magazine. And he's written a series of books and they're all good but I think they've been getting better. As uh, is not always the case. Uh, he wrote a book called When Corporations Rule the World and then another one called The Post-Corporate World and now The Great Turning where he really is starting to introduce the concept of a spiritual awakening, a spiritual revolution without which most of this stuff either will not happen or will not happen in a very enduring way. But I think he borrowed that term from a very popular American Buddhist teacher. In fact, She's a Berkeley person, Joanna Macy. And now that I've mentioned it, I think I'm going to ask her if she's free to come in and talk to us. Why not? Uh, she has – she – well, she comes from a very interesting background and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. But she has a very interesting way of looking at this process of complete transformation, complete in the sense that it would penetrate into every institution and rethink that institution from a s different set of values than what we've got now. She says, okay, we have to do three things. We have to resist the worst of the damage. We're, we're like they're about to cut down the last grove of redwood trees. We've got to get out there and do something about it. We have to create alternatives that are going to replace all of these things. So when we no longer have people logging redwood, how are they going to build houses? We have to be the ones experimenting with tamped earth or hay bales or mud or whatever we're going to use. We have a mud hut up at our ashram that Amy saw and uh, it's fine. It's been there for a long time. It doesn't melt away during the rain. Nobody lives in it. It's just some hose and shovels and stuff like that. But they've never complained. <laughs> so we have to resist the present system where it's at its absolute worst and it's going to kill us if we don't stop it. 
we have to create alternatives to steadily replace the whole thing, and then we have to change the culture. We have to come up with a new culture, which is a very mysterious process. Because the thing about cultures is usually in order for them to operate, they have to operate in the dark. You cannot say, well, I think this aspect of our culture isn't working. Let's change it. Because you need something that you can appeal to as a final recourse in decision-making, legal negotiation, and so forth. So you can't say, you know, well, I don't like the Constitution. We're going to change it. You, you, can, you can ignore it if you feel that you're going to get away with it. And nowadays, who, who doesn't? <laughs> when, when Iraq was having this process to write their constitution, somebody said, well, don't put them to all that trouble. Just give them ours. We're not using it. <laughs> uh, so mostly you have to have cultural <coughs> – your culture has to be handed down by God in the form of stone tablets from a burning bush or, <laughs> or you have to discover it under a bush in the desert and if, 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 if you were a Mormon. But it's not something that you can sit around and negotiate and discuss. But we have to. We now have to completely deconstruct the prevailing culture because it's a culture of death. I call it culture.com. That's a phrase I came up with yesterday. So we have to change the culture, and she sees that it's taking place on two levels. Cognitive, how do we understand stuff? And spiritual, which means how – I would say it means what do we believe about stuff? What especially what do we believe we are? If you think you are a material object that has been controlled by material objects that have no meaning and no consciousness, you'll have – one kind of culture. If you want to have a different culture, you've got to believe something else about human beings. So that's Joanna's scheme. And we can maybe I'll say come back to that in a couple of weeks when we talk about changing the culture. But I think it's clear to her and it's clear to me that this has to go from the bottom up. I mean this – in terms of long-term change, this is the most important. This is how you implement this and it will automatically sweep away what you need to sweep away in this part. And furthermore, I would say, and I'm sure she'd agree with me, the spiritual really underlies the cognitive. What, the way you see things depends on very deep values and belief systems. Um, so those are, those are two people who are weighing in uh, on the global crisis and how we have to shift it around. And if you happen to be at the Greens Festival last season in San Francisco, David Corton gave a very, very good talk. And he, he said, if you want to understand it in a nutshell, the corporate system is a system to turn nature into garbage for money. That's basically what it does. So that's the process that we've got to intercept. Okay, so here we go. Then let's talk about what globalism actually looks like. Uh, yeah, what it's, what it's done. Here are a few statistics. You don't th – this won't be unfamiliar to you and I'm not going to dwell on it for a long time because A, you already know most of this and B, it's depressing. <coughs> okay? And you, you can't have an education if you're depressed. So let's – but we have to have some kind of sense <laughs> of what's going on out there. Uh, next year – that's this year now – there are 50 million preventable deaths are expected of which 12 million are children. That is the equivalent of 13,000 trade centers every year. Okay, the reason this is from a book uh, – uh, an article by Richard Parker called From Conquistadors to Co-op Corporations. From Conquistadors to Corporations, which was in Sojourners in uh, 2002. So he said this because, of course, we pay – there is not a single American who does not know about the trade center deaths. But these 12 million children and 38 million other people are unknown to all but a tiny fraction of Americans. People just do not know that this is going on. A hundred years ago, six European states, namely Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, Nederland, and Portugal, 
ruled or otherwise controlled 60% of the world's population and territories. Now that system – this is me speaking, not Richard Parker – that system was brought to an end by your hero and mine the toothless lawyer from Gujarat, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. But uh, remember he said, I do not want to replace a system of white rulers with a system of brown rulers. We do not – it doesn't – the point is not who's doing the dominating. The point is to get rid of domination. And this is a phrase that's constantly used by the great turning people. You want to get from a domination system to a cooperation system. Uh, somehow after Gandhi did that, what, he what we succeeded in doing with his legacy was dislodge that set of rulers and allow them to be replaced with another set so that somehow things got worse after the imperial system folded. Since 1960 alone, the income gap between rich and poor countries has doubled, leaving the richest states controlling more global income than ever. While more than a billion people – that's a sixth, almost a sixth of the world – survive <coughs> on one dollar a day. And two, uh, two billion people survive on two dollars a day. That's more than I get for teaching this course, but I'm not putting myself in that category. This is really not quite – um, structural adjustments, quote unquote, have amounted to massive cuts in education and health care, more taxes on poor and middle class, less taxes on the rich. It's, it's – I remember in Gerrymander's book on t four arguments in favor of the elimination of television, he has a very, very interesting argument because he was an economist. He talks about the trickle-down theory. How are we going to build these wealthy corporations and their wealth would trickle down to professors and students and people like that. And he goes on for several pages describing how well this system was supposed to work. But then he has in a separate paragraph, he says, there was just one slight problem. New paragraph. It trickled up. <laughs> the wealth trickles up instead of down. And that's – it's structural adjustment and Bretton Woods is just a different way of institutionalizing the same energy. And it's easy to do that if you never think about energy and you think only about institutions. So since the 1970s, 100 countries in the world – that's almost half the world – have undergone economic decline. Sub-Saharan <coughs> Africans living on 20 percent less than they did 25 years ago. As a consequence, the numbers of the very poor during the 1990s alone grew by nearly 500 million people. That's a person for every dollar that British Petroleum wants to give the university. Half a billion people. Now, I was hearing from Mansura yesterday that uh, there's an interesting new way of thinking about uh, global economies that really bids fair to open our eyes to another dimension of this. And that is that if – that this is going to be very crude now. I, I hope you understand. I know less about economics than anybody. I mean I, I took one half of one <laughs> economics class and I went out of there screaming. Saying, Those people are crazy or I am. I prefer to believe it was them. So technically I know nothing about this subject. But a as wealth increases like so, it turns out that the UN measuring human development shows that wealth would make a tremendous difference for very poor countries where people don't have access to health care, food and, and pure water, which is going to be the new oil uh, in terms of global warfare. When you give people that – remember Gandhi's model in Gandhian economics, the food, clothing and shelter needs are a special category. They are the right of everybody and the responsibility of everybody to make sure everybody in the society, which in this case is the whole world, gets access to those basic needs. So as long as you're starting to plug in basic needs, human development – this is the, what I'm talking about here – is a human development index that was developed by the UN. Human development increases dramatically with wealth. 
up to a, per a certain point and then it levels off almost as dramatically. If you're measuring live births, um, other measurable physical parameters of human well-being, they stop growing along with the wealth curve beyond a certain point because that is all that money can do for you. Beyond that point, you need something else. Then they discovered another interesting thing that at a certain point when the excess goes way beyond what you need, human development actually goes inverse. It starts to decline. Then, of course, you have the king of Nepal, right? We've been thinking about the king of Nepal a lot lately, I'm sure. He developed a human happiness index. He says, never mind the gross national product. What the point is for people to be happy, not to be gross. <laughs> so <laughs> and this declines even more dramatically after wealth goes beyond a certain point. So uh, this is about all I'm going to say in terms of statistics about what globalism is doing to us. I want to start moving us more quickly to the violence aspect. But I want to share with you something that Manfred Steger developed after he came out with that little book. So this is like a very little book with a footnote. Here's the footnote. He delivered this at a conference in San Francisco uh, three years ago. He makes a distinction between globalization and globalism. Okay? Globalization is the process that's going on. Globalism is the belief system about that process. And he said that globalism before 9-11 had five characteristics. <coughs> the first was it was believed that this system was inevitable. And I'm going to say that it is a typical classic half-truth. It is uh, inevitable that we become more and more in contact with one another and that various kinds of national and ethnic boundaries break down. You know, if I were to ask you – just I'm not – but if I were to ask you to you know, raise your hand if you had one parent from like one continent or one ethnic division and another from another, you know, a fair number of you would say, oh yeah, I'm half this, I'm half that. My grandchildren are half half Jewish, half Mormo Catholic. <laughs> Very strange background. <laughs> They're sweet kids. Don't get me wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, but even on that very basic level, the world is globalizing. I got a phone call from my son in Nicaragua last week because he's just visiting somebody in his office. And he's come out laughing his head off because the guy has an Arabic name. He was born in Bethlehem and he's living in Nicaragua doing a plastics factory in Managua with posters of Krishna and Radha all over his office. So this is, this is, uh, this is inevitable that this is happening. And it's a, it's a process that you have to know how to manage. I mean this has always been how it worked. If you read Herodotus, which now I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. <laughs> how many of you have read Herodotus in the original Greek? No, never mind. You can keep your hands down. I, I know all of you have. Um, he was the first person to write as a Greek as a, this in, he was writing in the, toward the end of the Archaic period, the early 5th century BC, whatever they call it now, BCE, writing from the perspective of a Greek who was telling you about how the Persians, the Scythians, the Egyptians and other people lived and what gods they worshipped and what rituals they used, what practices, how they waged war and so forth. And uh, it was not unproblematic for the Greeks who had a very coherent sense of what their culture was to suddenly be exposed to other cultures. It is not entirely, not it is not entirely free of problem. I remember being told when I was taking an anthropology course a long time ago that there was a phenomenon known as ritual death that was happening in certain sub-Saharan African communities where people were suddenly exposed to Western civilization. It rendered – absurd their culture and it led them to feel they didn't know who they were and they were dying from no physical cause. They just gave up on life. So it's a process that we have to know how to manage but I 
I do agree with globalism that it's a process that's going to go on. Nobody's going to stuff that technology back in the bottle. Okay. The second thing, and you'll recognize where this comes from, it liberates the markets from control. So we now have a perfect Keynesian system where the whole world is turned into a trickle-down economy. But guess what? New paragraph. It's going to trickle up. It liberates markets to do their thing. The third belief in the globalism – let me put that down here. The globalism ideology, the third belief is that nobody is in charge. It's just happening. That's part of the inevitable piece. And fourth, it benefits everyone. Please suppress your laughter at this point. It benefits everyone. And if you look around and see people starving, they will say, it benefits everyone if you wait long enough. It will work as well as a mercantile system in a nation will. I'll get back to that term in a little bit. And the fifth belief is that it yeah, – how does he put it? It spreads democracy. Democracy follows the market. So this, in a word, is the neoliberal belief system. Now, his point is that item three changed after 9-11. So post 9-11, everything is – a couple of things are different here. One is it goes from nobody is in charge to the U.S. is in charge. And – yeah, Andrea? Oh, this is Manfred Steger. Yeah. This is a talk that he gave at – oops – at the uh, Institute – it's the Peace and Justice Studies Association talk he gave in San Francisco in 2004. I was the moderator of the panel, so I got to write down everything he was saying. So uh, point number three has been changed and point number – and a new point has been added. Point number six, they now believe that globalism requires a war on terror. And here's where we finally come in as PAX 164 people because this means uh, – and Steger points out <coughs> that the strategy of the United States – this is a tech – this is the title of a document for, for promulgated by the State Department. The strategy of the United States in 2002 has a seven or eight page section on the global market. So market and military values are completely merged here. And the big difference here is that since globalism, which is progress in a, in a nutshell, requires a war on terror, a nonviolent person is no longer a marginalized kook, which was bad enough. A person is a danger. Nonviolence is now a dangerous system, a dangerous idea. We haven't right quite started to see – the, the, the spill out of this concept, but I think we are going to see it. And in, in, the, in the W – I guess we have actually started to see it in the WTO uh, protests, which were at first very successful and then were contained by massive, massive repression after Seattle. Now, I mentioned the term mercantilism. This, this is an old idea from the early modern period. A mercantilist economy was one in which the economy of a state competed with other states. It was a comp competition-based economy. And what made it mercantilist was that the, it was protectionist. The government would make sure that there was a good balance of trade, meaning we sell more stuff than we buy. More stuff goes out than comes in. And you remember the brilliant observation of President Bush that almost all of our imports come from outside the country. <laughs> you, gotta, you have to keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, I take it back. I, I don't know less about economics than anyone in the world. <laughs> uh, you have to maintain a good balance of trade where you sell more than you buy so you get richer and richer so that you can get unhappy. 
<laughs> which <laughs> is the implicit goal for most people outside of yourself. And you're, it, you are doomed to perpetual competition. There's a limited – the global value is going to remain constant and you have to fight for your share of it. And that means that the military resources of the nation state are at the disposal of the economy. Really, it hasn't ever been a whole lot different. If you look at the way the British Empire moved in to India, they did not march in with an army and conquer them. They sent in business people. They set up the f India – the free – what was it called? John Company, the East India Trading Company went in there. Then they needed to protect their assets. You recognize that phrase? And then the country basically ends up in the hands of the British. So it's a very dangerous combination and uh, that is military, uh, the state, and the economy. Well, now something else uh, comes in to give us a little bit of a twist and I'm going to uh, then kind of have – just open it up for a discussion of how nonviolence should recalibrate itself to adjust to the new situation, which is partly new, partly not so new. But uh, I'm remembering a very poignant phrase in a documentary that I saw on the overthrow of apartheid, which is something that you have in your no, uh, Nonviolent Social Movements book. It was a success story in the short term. Nelson Mandela was basically released from prison because they knew the, what the Afrikaner regime knew that it was losing it and they might as well have a halfway <laughs> civilized person recovered for them. Uh, anyway, it was a largely – after having started very nonviolent and then taking a downturn in 1960 with the Sharpeville massacre when Mandela ends up going to prison after that. This is a long and very interesting story. It wasn't exactly what I wanted to do here though. It was a successful constitutional legal takeover of a regime, of, of a horrible regime and replacement of it by a much better regime. And uh, in the constitution of that country, the South African constitution, every person is guaranteed housing, food, and a job. Or it, it may be – I think they may have education in there also. But anyway, basic, basic to get you, you know, from here to here is guaranteed for every African in the Union of South Africa by their constitution. Okay, within I think about eight years, you took a look at what's actually going on and the destitution was worse than ever. Why? Because gl the global institutions the, uh, went in with their ideology and their neoliberalism and their structural adjustments and in no time everything was shifted again away from the poor. And guess what? Quote, unquote, unquote, it trickled up once again. It trickled up and out, up to the wealthy and out of the country. And so the very poignant line that I'm leading up to is a woman who was deeply involved in the struggle and the, in the final stages. She said, we rose up to seize the state – or in fact she said, we rose up and seized the state only to discover that it did not exist. The state was no longer in control. So. One simple way of looking at what's happening is that the nation state is losing mm, authenticity and hegemony and control. And what we're experiencing is a humongous struggle about what is – who's going to take over those resources. And basically there are two camps. This is oversimplifying a bit, but basically there are people who are very wealthy and well organized and there are people who are neither. And obviously the people who are wealthy and well organized, they have a significant advantage. What that says to me is that the only way – oh, and incidentally, this is sometimes called because Richard Falk at Princeton has come up with this term and I think it's pretty useful. The wealthy and well organized taking over the world through corporate networks, that's known as globalization from above. And what the resistance is known as globalization from below. So this is why this whole thing is half-truths and confusing because we all believe not only that globalism is inevitable, it seems to be where 
human destiny is taking us, you know, to, all, to be one family <coughs> on this planet. But what kind of family, you know, and who's going to be in charge of the family, that's what we're fighting over. So we're not fighting about whether there should be globalism or not. We're fighting about what kind of globalism done by whom. And obviously we have not been the first off the block because this, this system has been going on for a long time. In fact, uh, another person I'd like to mention here is Naomi Klein, who is a uh, brilliant Canadian journalist. You're allowed to have brilliant journalists in some countries. And she has been writing about globalism and, and she talks about the strategy, what you do when you want to impose neoliberalism neo on a country that hasn't been brought into the family yet. Uh, y one of the things that you do is downsize the government. You downsize the government, get rid of the competition, and then privatize all of these industries. So let's think about where that puts us because we've been saying – Let's see. What can we erase here? This will be for later on in the semester, so let's erase this. Um, we've been talking about people power, right, as you now know very well. And we've said that the old opposition used to be people power versus state power. And then Nagler comes along with his oddball ideas. And he says it's really a threefold thing because you have to take into account the inherent power in the individual, which really is the base of the pyramid for all of these things. But now suddenly it's not the people against the state anymore. In fact, very often the people are appealing to what are left of the government for protection against these rapacious corporate networks. And what's taking over the world in David Corton Volume 1 uh, era is basically the entire world being put – being made into a market where everything is commoditized. And let me just read you one example about that and then I'm going to try and leave enough time for us to have a discussion and I, th and I think this will work. But this is from Z Magazine for December of 2006. Um, and there's an article called GM Foods and World Hunger. And I'm just going to give you one highlight. Th now this is his language now. The food dictators who control intellectual property and patent monopolies over GM seeds and plants. These people recently attempted through the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization – you know, taking over global institutions for their own purposes, and the World Health Organization to use the famine in Zambia to market GM foods, food, genetically modified foods, through aid programs. Even though more than 45 African countries expressed a willingness to supply local, non-genetically modified relief and voiced support for Zambia's desire to not pollute its crops with GM food. So, you know, I keep saying that this is a, a new old system. It's really a new take on a larger scale with better technology of a system that's been in place forever. And it's, it really hasn't been always a classical system of a nature state uh, – the nation state, I mean, against other nations, the imperialists against victimized nations. It's a struggle between a, one ideology against another and a set of people who gravitates towards the ideology of exploitation, ownership, and competition versus people who feel somehow that that ideology is wrong. It's not what human beings have to end up being. So just if you – next time you're swimming at a uh, speaker, you walk out to Bancroft, Take a right. Go past the bus stop there. I assume you'll still see it. There's an advertisement that's been there for a long time. It's an advertisement for condos in San Francisco as if a Berkeley student could afford a condo in San Francisco. 
I don't know who this is supposed to be aimed at, this advertisement. But what it says is, buy the bay. B-U-Y, not B-Y. B-U-Y, the bay. In other words, this is training people to regard the world as an object, as a commodity which they can buy and sell. Who owns the bay that people should come along and buy it? I mean, I think we should have a wallet-sized version of Chief Seattle's speech where he says, you cannot own the earth and we should all carry it around in our wallet. Okay, so now let me quickly turn to some of the ways that the resistance is getting itself together. If you think about Gandhi's main ideas, there are two of them which if you were to implement those ideas, globalism from above would disappear immediately. And those two ideas are trusteeship and swadeshi. You cannot buy and sell the bay if you are its trustee, right? You want to just make sure that it's still a habitat for certain kinds of ducks and you want to get all of those car batteries out of it that, we p that people dumped in there for about 30 years. I have a friend who works on that in a nonprofit that just dredges car batteries out of the bay so the lead won't be poisoning the fish. Um, and if you're a trustee, Instead of an owner, will absolute globalism simply will not be able to operate. That is the neoliberal top-down type of globalism. And then we'd be free to discover one another as one big family with unity and diversity and all the rest of it. The other idea, of course, is svadeshi, which means localism. And that was reflected in gerrymander and Ed Goldsmith's book against the global economy and for a turn toward the local. If you do Swadeshi, there would be nobody to organize an exploitive system and take it across the top and, ex and exploit other people with it. Okay, so keep the, those ideas of decentralization, localism, and non ownership. If we just had grasped, I've been told that I use the word grok too frequently, but I'm going to use it one more time. If we had just grokked those ideas, we would. Uh, we, the world population, whoever we're talking about here, would you, you'd never have this global disaster that's coming up. So let me give you then one example of uh, a way that's being – a way this is being fought from another article. There's a very non-local chai I'm probably drinking here, but that's okay. Uh, this is from Peacework. Subtitled Global Thought and Local Action for Nonviolent Social Change. And this, uh, you'll find these in that shelf that I pointed out to you. It's outside our office in Stevens. And this is an article called Globalization Co op Style. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, take, yeah, okay, let's have globalization, but let's do it with co ops. And it turns out, well, let me read you the opening paragraph. In the early 1900s, a long, long time ago, fishing and farming families throughout Atlantic Canada came together in study circles, often around their kitchen tables, to learn about their economy. Very, very local. I remember doing the free speech movement. We – I don't know who I'm talking about here, but you know, people with beards or long ponytails, depending on whether you were a boy or a girl. We <laughs> decided that we didn't like the university. It's a big, uh, a big institution. <laughs> oh, yeah. In fact, I want to say something about our university. I'll get back to that in a second. So we started something called the Free University. And uh, we, we, just, we just met in you know, various odd places. Coffee in those days was terrible. So we didn't often meet in coffee shops. There was no lattes or anything. It was a real deprivation. But we would meet in one place or another. And I remember uh, trying to learn ancient Chinese from somebody who happened to know a little bit about that language. And that experiment lasted about four weeks, I think. You know, learning Chinese is not a very easy thing to do if you're not a native speaker of that language. And there was really nothing to sustain the concept of a university without walls. It was a beautiful idea. but. There wasn't enough clarity and enough momentum behind it. So let me – I want to now back up a second and add something to what I was saying about how the states 
governments are now playing an extremely ambiguous role. They are, of course, they're much bigger than local communities, much, much, much bigger than individuals, so they have their dangers to begin with. But in a way, they're better than what we've got, what we're heading into getting right now. And if you want to think about how that works, just think of our own university. When I came here, I think something like 50, 54 percent of the university's budget was provided by the state of California. And that meant, you know, there was fairly ample money to go around for experiments, not for nonviolence. Of course, let's not be ridiculous. But experiments in various things, like should we have a department of demographics? Let's try it. Hire five or six people, you know, teach it for a while, see what happens. And most of these ideas were thought up by this odd group of middle people who don't really belong anywhere. They're called professors. They have no power, but at that point they still had a little bit of prestige. Now, I think I may get the numbers slightly wrong, but the last I heard it's something like 20 percent of the university's budget comes from the state government, which means 20 percent of the money is coming from the public. Where is the rest of the money going to come from? Enter beyond petroleum. You now come into a situation like this and you say, hey, we'll give you half a billion dollars, which is really not a lot of money to them. But you know that old song, been down so long, it looks like up from here. And the next verse is, a $10 bill looks like a window shade to me. <laughs> it's kind of like the half a billion dollars is more money than you ever dreamed of hearing about in your whole life, and everything is swept away. There's like one or two lone faculty voices saying, maybe genetic modification isn't the way to go for getting new energies, for getting new energy sources. And anyway, it, uh, I have experienced myself in my own life what happens when you take power away from government and give it to corporations. Because basically governments are, even if they are uh, despotic governments are somewhat dependent on the will of the people. Corporations are the most efficient entities for money making and they're completely insulated from the will of the people. They have but one responsibility which is to, to bring in cash. Okay, so now, I've, now that we're just about as depressed as we're going to get for the rest of the week, let's start building it back up. So here are these Canadians. Sitting at lots of good things start in that country, uh, sitting around their kitchen tables learning about their economy. What an idea. <laughs> you know, they, they live off their economy every day, but it never dawned on them that they should have something to do with it. They should study how it works. And they developed, they used a curriculum which was developed by men and women who were connected with a university, St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. Okay, this did not come from Harvard, Oxford, Göttingen, or Cambridge. It came from a relatively out of the way university and a relatively out of the way place. So this curriculum explained to people how the, their wealth was being extracted by middlemen who lived elsewhere, who owned the means to turn the farming and fishing communities into, quote, val value added products even as other middlemen were selling them their agricultural inputs, the foods, the fuel, and other consumer goods. So they're being literally sold a bill of goods at the highest prices possible, and they're being paid the lowest prices possible for their product. And they're, if there's people doing this are smart, they'll keep these farmers and these fishing people barely alive so they won't go into destitute. They don't want to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. So this is how the system works. My, my son works with a farmer in Nicaragua who lives on the Atlantic coast – sorry, Pacific coast, uh, one of those coasts. And uh, the community is called Salinas Grande, which means the big salty. <coughs> and they, one of the things that he does is he collects sea salt. Sea salt is now – you probably are not aware of this. I wasn't either. But sea salt is a very yuppified commodity now. You can buy it in Andronicos and Olivers for like eight dollars for a little vial of it like this and you convince yourself that you're having a more satisfying experience than somebody else is just taking, you know, Morton's and dumping it on their hamburger. <laughs> and uh, 
So this stuff is selling like eight or ten dollars for a little thing like that. And uh, Pablo is getting ten dollars for a kilo. Or, or sorry, sorry, for a hundred kilo sack. So people are just, you know, siphoning and siphoning and siphoning off that wealth all the way up and down the line. It's even worse with heroin, but I told Josh not to get involved in the heroin <laughs> trade. Uh, anyway, what happened in this, uh, in this area is it, was, it started with an adult education effort. So please take note. Education is a very powerful tool if used correctly. And it led to the creation of hundreds of co-ops and credit unions across the region which had what are called today economies of scale. In other words, the economy operates within the region to which it pertains. It's, uh, you are not, um, you're not really being owned and operated by mega institutions and mega corporations that are hundreds of miles away. Ah. Let me tell you this, the rest of this really quickly and see if, if we have time for a discussion. I'm sorry that I've, I went on and on today, we, but we'll make up for it. Um, the main point that these people hold before themselves as their ideology is in traditional economic thinking, all, each of the units competes. The minute there's a unit, the people in there close their eyes to other units and say, how do we thrive? So. If you weigh in on the side of the consumer, the consumer says, I want to pay the lowest cost possible for my milk or whatever else I'm buying. The producer says, I want to get as much money as I can and they're in inevitable perpetual conflict. So their spokesman says, this does not reflect the cooperative values of interdependence. What if farmers and consumers were committed to treat each other fairly? In other words, what if the relationships mattered and what if you saw yourself as a cooperative interdependent unit? And as you're probably aware, there is an institution called Community Supported Agriculture. Whoops. CSAs, which are all over the country. There's maybe – there's tens of thousands, maybe more. In these communities, there's one right near me. The farmer asks the local people what they want. And the local people say, I'd like to get uh, zucchini. That's crazy. Nobody wants zucchini. But let's just take zucchini as an example. Okay, how many can you use? You know, 10 bushels of zucchini. Okay, that's what we'll plant. And so you don't have any of this anxiety about, oh my God, what if nobody buys my products? I'll go broke. Um, and it, it's interdependent. And that has led in some places even to a barter economy where you come into the CSA and you work for part of your food. And that's, that's going on all over the country. And you don't know about it because it has to stay under the tax radar. So a lot of these communities are not really quite legalized yet, not to mention the people working on them. Um, and one of the models that they use, they, they went about this in a very intelligent way. It didn't just spring up from the soil. They went around studying things like the Rochdale community, which was the, probably the oldest co-op in the country, maybe the oldest in the uh, industrialized world. They looked at an area in the Basque region of France where they started – we're running out of space here. Uh, an, an area called Mondragon where they, s they tried to reconstruct capitalism. They wanted to build capitalism with a human face. It was all started by a Catholic priest. His name is Father Arismendi. And he started it not around kitchen tables but in bars in the Basque country. He would go in and talk to these farmers. said factories were failing in that region because it's, you know, it's um, a region that the, 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 Span the Spanish are very nervous about. Something about bombs. I don't quite follow this. But they were letting the region run down. They said, what if we take it back and we build our own factories? And they were not against capitalism. This is the interesting thing. Everybody who works in one of these plants owns part of the plant. Well, what if you come in and you don't have any capital? Okay, a certain part of your salary is tithed to giving you ownership in the plant. So after you've worked there for 10 years, you have a reasonable share. It's not that you don't have managers. 
but managers can only earn ten times more than a beginning line worker. Ten times more may sound like a lot, but bear in mind if you're working for Disney as a file clerk, the CEO of Disney, who I understand is the wealthiest, highest paid CEO in the world, he's getting hundreds of thousands of times more money than you're getting. I once figured out that the chancellor was getting five times more than I was, and I didn't like that at all because I didn't think I was only as good as a fifth of the chancellor. But what are you going to do? So they, they do have capitalism in the sense that they manufacture products with using capital and building infrastructure, but they don't let it run out of hand, and it's been a very successful experiment. So they studied that. And what they have tried to develop is what they call – a stakeholder model instead of an investor-owned model. In other words, you don't own the factory because you had the money to invest in it and therefore you get to say everything – who manufactures what, how much money it's sold for, and so forth. Instead, e everybody who has a stake in this, who's involved in it in one way or another, whether you're the end consumer or you're a worker or a farmer or you're an investor, you get to form a cooperative and decide what to do with this whole operation. And let me underline some of the language here and then apologize for having not let you say even one single peep the whole time. We'll make up for that. Uh, the power of cooperative business alternative is that it can nurture what is best in people. That's an incredible concept which you will see very often advertised but falsely. Nurture what is best in people and enable us to meet our needs in ways in which everyone wins. Now, in those simple words, there's a lot of nonviolent ideology packed into them because you're talking about needs. When you're talking about needs, you're not talking about wants. So you're smack on target. Oh, sorry, sorry. You are very much lined up with Gandhian economics. And you have a concept in which everyone wins. So it's you're not using the competitive instinct to drive success. Uh, one last phrase. In such a world, there would be no place for the violence that's inherent in competitive, greed-fueled, buyer-beware economics. So to sum it up, and I have uh, – they have a list of their values and stuff here. would be very interested if you're writing you, – you, you might find this very interesting if you're writing on that uh, in any way. But to sum it up, I would say that we have a network of very, very promising constructive program alternatives that are going on out there. I've said this before. I'll say it again. What we don't have is somebody looking at the whole picture and saying we should be doing constructive program here an obstructive program here, and now we need CP, now we, had it, now we need OP. We don't have that strategic overview. But I think it's starting to build. It's starting to come. People are beginning to realize this. Okay, I can't believe 24 hours ago I was stricken with anxiety that I would have nothing to say today. And uh, <laughs> the, this logoria is the result of all of that. So good to see you people again, and I'll see you on Thursday. Hi there. Um, I, I didn't realize you about my mid